Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second class on the topic of artificial intelligence and architecture. This class is uh, somehow very difficult and even more complex than the first one. If the first one concerned the uh, general idea, general definition, in artificial intelligence in general, in this case we are trying to touch something a little bit more deep somehow a detail on the previous conception. First of all, we are going to discuss some logic beside the artificial intelligence, but in the process of operation. If in the first class the idea was very general, we touch even some philosophical concern about artificial intelligence in general and also artificial intelligence apply in urban planning and architecture. In this case, we need to touch something a little bit more concrete. We will also try to apply some idea of artificial intelligence in the uh, urban planning and architecture. And this is the topic of the section two of this class. In the third part of this class, we will show some uh, little movie, some uh, animation, and we will comment uh, the image. And we will find pretty interesting because uh, it is a sort of experiment, uh, somehow a little bit immature for now, how the artificial intelligence can be applied into the design. Again, uh, the second class is divided in three parts. The first part is still a little bit theoretical, but uh, touching more the ground. The second part is about uh, some experiment already existing in uh, urban planning and architecture. And the third one, it is uh, some case. During the composition of this class, we find some uh, unusual situation. If uh, the first impression, even from myself, was uh, that the artificial intelligence already very deep, very mature in a certain area of architecture, well, I must take back my words because we are still very far in the mature application of artificial intelligence in urban planning and in architecture. We can see that uh, sometime the position of the designer, it is uh, too much commercial, too much business oriented. The real experiment in artificial intelligence and architecture are limited or in the use of some specific tool or still uh, fixed on parametric, but the real use of artificial intelligence in architecture and urban planning is still at the very beginning. But uh, there are some, it's a very good beginning, I have to say. An important element that I want to remark in this case is uh, during the investigation in the past weeks, in the past months, I find it quite hard to divide uh, architecture and urban planning. If the discipline is quite um, clear, there are a very specific process and very specific area of investigation in urban planning, which sometimes are very different from architecture, building design, in the case of artificial intelligence apply for architecture and urban planning, this partition is still not very mature. What we intend to say is that uh, very often artificial intelligence touch at the same level architecture, building design and urban planning. Sometimes we come back uh, like 100 years ago when the great master in uh, architecture was at the same time great designer for building, but also great designer for cities. So somehow the discipline come back again and we find that the technique of artificial intelligence are valid in both of the cases, building design and city design and concept. Another issue that we need to discuss now before to start our discussion on artificial intelligence and uh, architecture and urban planning, it is that the, there is no specific partition in between analysis and design. It is a sort of universe and uh, the analysis can directly flow into the architecture design and urban planning design. Somehow, we come back to the discussion that we have seen in the previous class about what we have called DDA and DDD, data-driven analysis and data-driven design. So the artificial intelligence, with all the discussion about uh, 
data collection, data mining, big data, and all the technology related on internet, it is a very current, very close in between analysis and design. Somehow, the analysis, the data acquiring, the data processing, data analysis, and then data design, they are very, very close to each other. It is a sort of big package. The big problem in this moment is to find the appropriate methodology to let the data flow from the analysis into the design. I think in this specific historical moment, this phase, it is still not very good, not very mature. There are some experiments. Those experiments are very interesting and very challenging, but we are a little bit far from the final goal. The key goal, I remind once again, the big hope for the artificial intelligence is to find an automatic way where the architecture can be generated directly by the data acquired from internet, from the technologies. So what is the dream? The dream is a sort of automatism based on artificial intelligence, where the data collected over internet, the data collected by machine, can be directly flow used from raw material into the final products without the intervention of the human being. This is the wish, this is the general understanding that we are going to investigate in the lesson number two, in the chapter number two of our class. The first point that we need to discuss, it is the logic and artificial intelligence. This is the title of this slide. Yes, according with some key scholar, for example, Niels Nielsen, one of the great masters in the artificial intelligence, there is a critical problem, and uh, I completely agree on his vision. Generally talking, the human being considers the logic something very compact, something very useful. For example, the behavior of a person who is strictly logic, somehow it is uh, positive. We can be sure that this person is quite uh, trustable, for example, because his behavior, it is not emotional or it is not crazy or even irrational. Some action which can be dangerous or paranoid or schizophrenic or based on certain kind of uh, mental illness. Logic, logicism, it is a sort of process which can drive the human being and the thinking in different phases, in different process, strictly connected to each other. And the final result, it is very close to the premises, to the initial part. So somehow it is a sort of path, it is a sort of sequence, step by step, which ensure that our discussion or our behavior, it is rational. Logicism provides a point of view and principle for constructing languages and procedures using by intelligence machine. Now, logicism somehow, it is not only something that belongs to the human being, but those kind of logicism based on logic, it is a very good process, procedures that can flow directly from the human thinking into the machine. Somehow the human being imagine, guess, have the imagination that the logic, it is a good process. And the machine should use this kind of strict sequence of thinking also for their process. So this is why a key discussion in artificial intelligence concerns the logicism. A logic process which can drive the machine from an initial state to a good conclusion. Somehow it is a sort of uh, method of good thinking. And this is very strong, for example, in the Western country, in the in Western culture. But for example, also the Hinduism, the classic culture of Hindu, it is uh, very powerful on this process. There are some classic book which teach how to have a very strict logic sequence of consideration. 
thinking. In the discussion about artificial intelligence, the word logic, in my opinion we should use human logic, it is not very important. We have to remember that artificial intelligence, it means a intelligence which is mechanical, a intelligence which is non-human, but also non-biological. So, in a strictly and in a general point of view, the idea of logic is not that important in the process of artificial intelligence. The human logic is irrelevant for evaluating the intelligent machine. That is very strange at the first glance. But if we think better, if we think deeply, I don't think that the human logic it is very necessary for the machine. For example, in the logic of human being, the continuation of the human species, for example, the reproduction, for example, to have a family or to have a child and so on, it is a value which is uh, quite common for the human being. But for the machine, no. The machine could be based on a completely different logic. The virus or the bacteria, they have different logic compared with the human being. So, in the case of the artificial intelligence, the idea of logic is not that important, but at least the human logic is not so strict as we can imagine at the first moment. And this is very tricky because every form of uh, artificial intelligence, every form of building an artificial intelligence should be not based on human logic, but another form of logic, more abstract somehow. And there is a paradox which Nielsen point out in his discussion. In theory, we also can create an illogical machine and it could work. For example, we can create a machine which is a program for self-destruction. In terms of human logic, that is quite uh, mad or it is considered a sort of pathology. How we consider the suicide? Suicide, it is very negative, but a machine which is programmed to destroy itself after the use could be quite normal. There are cases that we can quote as illogical machine or machine that after its use can be destroyed. I give you an example. When we buy a computer, could be a very good idea that when the computer is old, simply dissolve. It will be a great invention for the pollution. You can imagine that after you buy a machine or after you buy uh, a car or anything mechanical, after its use, when it is broken, simply disappear forever. If you consider very clearly, this is the street logic that you use when you have a useless file. Think about your work. Your common work may include the generation of files in your computer. When a file is not useful anymore, what do you do? You simply delete, erase. And when you put into the trash can, then it stayed there for a certain kind of time and then the machine automatically destroyed that file after a certain time, one month, for example. That is exactly what I mean. The computer, it is programmed to destroy forever a file that it is no use for more than a certain time, 30 days for default, but could be one month, one year, three months, it doesn't matter. So this kind of programming, it is illogical in terms of uh, human being. No one can imagine a sort of human relationship where when my friend is or as another person is not useful anymore, simply dissolve forever. <laughs> that is simply insane and even criminal. But this is how our machine it works today. So, what Niels Nielsen pointed out when he mentioned the illogical machine is exactly this. A machine can be programmed to be illogical. In terms of logic and artificial intelligence, there are several phases, very important, and we need to briefly point out. Nielsen mentioned that the, the thesis number one could be intelligent machine will have knowledge of their environment. That is a key point in our discussion. 
What is artificial intelligence, in fact? It's a sort of uh, sequence of uh, command that have a certain goal, a certain finalization. But uh, everything has to be based on some data that I have to put inside the machine. We already mentioned many times and uh, extensively what we mean on that point. For example, all the sensor around the world today, or even when we type on the keyboard of our computer, or when we talk with the telephone, or even the GPS positioning in our telephone, that generate data. Now, the thesis number one of Nielsen, it is very important because assert that the machine should have, or better, must have knowledge about what happened around. The simple GPS, it is the perfect example. Even if you don't touch your telephone, your smartphone, it is already settled to acquire data of its position in the world. This is a key strategy, actually, in every form of artificial intelligence. The intelligent machine should understand the environment. And this is very important because environment could mean position, as the GIS mentioned, could be related on humidity, temperature, weather, CO2, pollution, 3D imaging, camera, everything you can imagine. Yes, because the logic itself of big data, it is based on this point billion and billion of sensors that get data. Those data, it is not organized, it is arrived data. I perfectly agree with you, but this is exactly what the sensor is doing. Now, the intelligent machine should use those raw data to understand what happened around. And uh, even simple machines are based on this logic. Uh, Nielsen mentioned a very interesting case, a simple thermostat, the very old machine to measure the temperature, it is uh, analogic, it is not digital, that kind of simple machine has somehow answer to this task. He has the knowledge that the temperature in a certain room, it is 24 degrees. It doesn't communicate too much. It doesn't understand what does it mean that a specific temperature, but it has the knowledge of the environment. From that simple thermostat to a much more sophisticated machine or sensor, or even a sort of global intelligence that get all the data of this world and summarize into a specific state. So from the thermostat to a super artificial intelligence, we are exactly on the same point. We have a machine, a system, which understand their environment. There is a second thesis that Nielsen points out. The most versatile intelligent machine will represent much of their knowledge about their environment declaratively. This, it means that a real intelligent machine is able to acquire data and then finally represent in a form of abstraction the situation of the environment, the world, the universe, in a very precise and clear idea. It declares the state of the world. According with the, the expert in this area of artificial intelligence, there are two forms of knowledge which is quite important for our discussion. The first one, it is called declarative knowledge, and the second one, it is called procedural knowledge. Now, the definitions are very complicated and we have to be simple in our discussion because we are architects, we are urban planners, we are not philosophers or programmers. A simple definition of declarative knowledge, it shows that declarative knowledge is encoded explicitly in the machine in a form of sentence in some language. Attention, this sentence is quite precise. They don't say in English language or Italian or Chinese, but in a form of language. We have to remember, and all the experts agree, at least in the state of the art of the research of artificial intelligence, that language and intelligence, they are strictly connected. There is no intelligence without language. 
This is important. So, when we discuss the artificial intelligence, we have to remember that artificial intelligence it is always related on language. So, the declarative knowledge it is always based on sentence. Yes, because sentence generate a sort of logic about the world, the universe. And then what happened? It happened that there is the procedural knowledge, which is manifested in programs in machine. Programs, it means programming, steps, sequence of fact, sequence of action. So somehow, the machine acquire data, understand the world, understand the universe, according with the thesis one. And then, thanks of the thesis two, it is a sort of language which translate the universe outside the windows, as we say in our metaphor, and then organize into sequence. Those sequence could be sentences, which kind of sentences? Sentences in a form of language. Which language? Any form of language. For example, the sequence of uh, the binary code. That is a language. Or English or Chinese or image or pixels. It doesn't matter. Important is that this language should have a rule. The same language have to be used to generate process. The progress in the machine it means that the machine should follow a certain kind of sequence of command to generate a sort of output. And here, according with Nielsen, start the notion of level of knowledge. Uh, yes, because everything in the universe, it is based on the level of knowledge. For example, a little bird, it has a sort of level of knowledge, less than John von Neumann of course, or at least different than John Ford Neumann. But there is different level of knowledge. A typical case is a student. When a boy or a girl, a kid, starts the kindergarten, he has a sort of knowledge of the world, very limited. Then, when he passes through the primary school, middle school, high school, and so on, until maybe the PhD, the doctoral degree, he has a much more sophisticated level of knowledge of the universe. And then genius can come out and their level of knowledge is very high. This happens also for the artificial intelligence. A simple thermostat or a super sophisticated computer or the most advanced artificial intelligence that we can imagine or even a super artificial intelligence. In that case, in every case, there is always a sort of level of knowledge. And I want to add a personal opinion, a personal idea. Very often, we quote the fact that the artificial intelligence, it is specialized in a certain area. In the previous lesson, we quote the fact that there are a lot of software which is able to win the great master for chess or the game of Go. And the classic argumentation is that, yes, those software are intelligent, but they cannot cook food or they cannot paint. That is, I think it's a wrong position. Because, for example, the great master chess, Kasparov, he is an excellent master for chess, but maybe he is not very good as a painter or he is not very good to play bandoleon, the popular instrument. The point is, there is no universal intelligence, a human being which is able to do everything. We know very well that, for example, John von Neumann was a great uh, genius in several disciplines. He was a humorous guy, he opened many new paths in science. Also, for example, Poincaré. Poincaré was a great genius. But uh, maybe they were not so good in uh, sport. So, in fact, they never win any Olympic Games. My point is, every intelligence, human or artificial, it is always specialized. So, the point is this. There is uh, always a level of knowledge and a level of intelligence. It is not very appropriate. The idea that several scholars said, yes, this software, it is intelligence, but it is very far to have a general intelligence. 
that is perfectly the same also in the human intelligence. Human intelligence, it is always specialized. Myself, I met some Nobel Prize, great mind in their discipline, but outside their discipline, they are almost unable to talk. No excellencies in uh, art or in music or in food or even a simple conversation was quite problematic. And this is a very classic in great genius. Another case is, for example, the great musician Bohuslav Martino. He is one of the greatest musicians of all the time, but in the personal relationship, he was a disaster. He was completely absorbed in his world. So, we have to be very clear that artificial intelligence, a specialized artificial intelligence, is intelligence. And the opposition that this artificial intelligence is very limited only in one game, in my opinion, it is not very good. It is not solid. Another point very important in our discussion about artificial intelligence is the type of knowledge. Any knowledge that is ascribed to a machine may be given declarative interpretation by an outsider observer. We will not say that the machine possesses declarative knowledge unless such knowledge is actually represented by explicit sentences in the memory of a machine. In this case, uh, I think that what it is important, uh, it is the fact that uh, there is always a sort of communication, a sort of uh, logic structures of a discourse in between machine and something outside. I think this sentence is um, quite tricky, it's very interesting in my point of view, because if we are talking about knowledge, and especially knowledge in artificial intelligence, we are in front of a process which say, it exists a world, it exists the universe, this universe have to be acquired by the machine, organized in form of language, and then finally ejected and transmit to others. Only when it exists, here we quote, explicit sentences in the memory of the machine, then only in that case we are in front of knowledge. And I completely agree, because otherwise we are in front of raw material. I give you an example. A sequence of numbers, it means nothing. But if those numbers are interpreted as a organized data, it can come out, for example, a music. So there are always a sort of sequence of instruction which transform numbers into something which makes sense. In the artificial intelligence, and here is the difference with the previous season of computing, in the artificial intelligence, a machine can understand that a certain kind of sequence of binary code is a music. I remember very well the change in between analogic and digital in music with the first CD, the old CD. It was a really a remarkable innovation and we don't understand very well at that time the difference in between the old system and the new system. There are a lot of experts of music which still love the analogic because of the quality, the sound, it was much more warm, much better in terms of human feeling. But the digital was much better in terms of quality and with all the advantages that we know now. But the advantages was not very clear at that time. And now, only now, after 30 or 40 years, we know how good is the digital sound. Good in terms of clearness, in terms of uh, processing. At that time, or better, until today, the digital sound was very good because human beings can enjoy. There is someone who play piano or an orchestra who perform some music. The sound, the wave, the physical wave was transformed into numbers, transmit into a machine. They print a CD or they transmit over internet, it doesn't matter. And then another machine is able to transform that sequence of binary code into sound again. And then this is the trick. The machine in between the orchestra and 
ourselves who listen to music don't understand what happened. It is a sequence of numbers. Those sequence of numbers could be music or a receipt for a pizza or a text, it doesn't matter. That is not important. The artificial intelligence makes all the difference because the artificial intelligence is able to understand that that specific sequence of numbers, it's a music or the receipt to create a pizza or a text. This is the main difference. When we discuss the knowledge in artificial intelligence, we are discussing about a sort of interpretation, better a declarative interpretation, that the machine is able to generate because that specific sequence of number or data, it makes sense inside the memory of the machine thanks of some explicit sentences. In order to conclude the discussion about the declarative knowledge, we have to notice that this point is particularly important in every possible argumentation concerning artificial intelligence. Because the declarative knowledge, it is basically a sort of a process, way, method to let the human and machine, or machine and machine, but in fact also human and human, every possible entity could communicate to each other. So we remark once again that the issue of the language, it is fundamental for every discussion about artificial intelligence. So every possible logic concerning artificial intelligence and in general every discussion about logic have to be based on a sort of language. And it doesn't mean which kind of language. Important is it should be a language coding, English, some abstract uh, language, it doesn't matter, forms, anything, which have to generate a sort of relationship in between word and mind. And intentionally I use the word mind, because in the case of artificial intelligence, we always dis discuss about mind. We are not going to discuss about uh, personality, or something else at this stage, but mind. And it is not a case that mind is also the famous paper of uh, Alan Turing, where firstly discussed the, the issue of uh, the uh, intelligence of the machine. Language, please remember the issue of the language because it is fundamental in every possible discussion about artificial intelligence. And the declarative knowledge is exactly this, communication in between minds, artificial minds or natural minds, it doesn't matter, that is a point. In fact, if we want to add the very last issue on this topic, we have to remind the problem that happened in the lab of Facebook, when the two machines start to have a dialogue by themselves, and they develop a sort of dialogue by themselves, which doesn't correspond to any possible semantic from natural language, from English. In that case. So what happened is that the controller, the human who was responsible for that, uh, that project, immediately switched off the machine because they are afraid to don't control anymore the language that the two machines are going to use. And then automatically they are unable to understand what they are talking about. And that is a very important problem in every form of artificial intelligence because it seems quite logic and in fact happen all the time that the machine could develop their own language, all declarative knowledge based on different language by human and then the machine are not controlled anymore simply because we human cannot understand and what the machine is going to discuss because they adopt a different project, different logic. So this kind of currency in between human and machine, it's quite important in every possible discussion about artificial intelligence. This one, it is not uh, unusual. I want to remark that the development of the new language it is quite common, for example, in between two different generations. In between parents and child, there is always a gap in between uh, languages uh, because the young generation develop a sort of slang or simply because the language evolves in something different. So the two generations don't understand anymore because the value and also the declarative knowledge, it is different. In this slide, we discuss the advantages of the declarative knowledge. The author, 
discuss three main points, three main issues of uh, the declarative knowledge should have. A. Public access. B. Reliability. C. Formality, bootstrapping and universality. Concerning the three points, they are all very important because it, it shows that the language and every possible language in, in detail, the declarative knowledge, have to be based on fundamental rules. These fundamental rules are not related on any specific language. For example, try to give a very few idea about what we are discussing about. Public access. Public access means that every declarative knowledge is accessible to many people. Now, this is the interesting issue because every discussion, every knowledge, every language have to be understandable by many people. For example, if in this moment I start to speak a very peculiar language, a dialect which is limited to a very specific area, no one understands me. Or if my idea are based on a sort of grammar or semantic which is simply unusual or personal, no one can understand me. Or even if my idea are based on a specific a logic process, then I am simply unable to communicate the idea. Public access means that those kind of language, declarative knowledge as we want to call, must be understandable, accessible to many people. And this is what happened, again, I mentioned again the problem in uh, Facebook lab, when the machine start to discuss a language which only the machine can understand. The human are immediately excluded. This is a vice versa problem because when the scientists, when the coder, the programmers are going to elaborate a language which is uh, dedicated to the computer, they must be very careful because of this kind of language have to be at the same time good for processing for the machine, but must be solid enough to describe the universe to describe the world, the real state of the world. And at the same time, this kind of language have to be able to communicate with the human. This is a fundamental problem because, for example, when we will analyze in the following class the issue of IoT, Internet of Things, that is the point. Because, for example, one element of the Internet of Things, it is the uh, recording of the weather, humidity, the climate condition, traffic. The physical situation it is acquired by sensor and by the sensor it is transmitted to internet and uh, cloud and then finally this kind of data can be processed by computer. This is the point. The data are acquired which it means the physical situation are acquired by sensor transformed into data and then finally processed and then finally the output will give to the human being the state of a certain physical situation near or far. The simple question uh, that every morning you do when you wake up and ask to your mobile phone what is the weather outside, that is exactly what we mean. In the past you simply look outside the the window, there is a sunshine, there is a rain, it is cold, it is hot, and then is a direct information in between your body and the climate condition. But nowadays, we need a sort of sensor which catch the physical situation, elaborate, transform those physical situations into numbers. Those numbers have to be collected by another computer have to be processed and then have to be graphically visualized on your telephone. It is a very complex system and everything it is based on declarative knowledge which has a public access. For the point number B, reliability, also in this case we have to notice that every possible declarative knowledge or language must be extremely solid. Solid, it means that have to, the language have to be reliable, but also, and this is the point that the scholars mention in this sentence, the conclusion of this elaboration, the logic step in between initial assumption and final output, have to be checked and the conclusion have to be valid. That is very important. For example, who can control the steps, the calculation in between initial point and the final point. Initial assumption, initial input and the final output. This kind of sentence mentioned very clear that all the people or many people can 
check if the conclusion is valid or not. This is what does it mean, reliability. In this point start a um, controversial point. Now it is quite famous the idea of quantum computing. According with a certain scholar, the quantum computing is uh, controversial because it is very difficult to check the process in between input and output. Input and output in between, there are a sort of strange situation where it's very difficult to understand if the process is reliable or not. On the last point of formality bootstrapping universality, it is also very interesting in our point of view because it shows that the operation, it means the process that is going to happen in between initial state and final state in between input and output should have a very little experience with the universe that they are going to discuss. What does it mean? I give you an example. If a sensor record the temperature outside, the outdoor temperature or indoor temperature, it doesn't matter, the sensor itself should not have the perfect knowledge about the environment they are going to record. They only required the checking, the recording of a certain kind of data, temperature or humidity or sound. That's it. That kind of data have to be recorded in a sort of formal language and then transferred to a much complex system. So this is very important because the data are processed in a very simple and limited way. Directly connected with the previous element, uh, there is a very important point which several scholars point out, and it is the concept of uh, context-free. What does it mean, context-free? Generally talking, uh, in the natural language, English, Italian, Chinese, whenever, especially Chinese, this is very common in Chinese, the meaning of a certain words, the meaning of a certain terms, it depends on the context of the sentence. For example, the meaning of a certain sentence can change a lot according with the situation that we are going to refer. This is a typical, for example, in Chinese. I just mentioned one key word in Chinese, the ideograms Dao. The ideograms Dao, it could mean many things. It could be in a simply road, but the Dao, it is also a fundamental character in the, the Daoism, uh, famous uh, Chinese doctrine. According with the context of the discussion, the words change the meaning. And this is a typical of Chinese language, for example. But it is also very common in uh, many other languages. Context-free, it means that in the case of artificial intelligence, the sentence have to be independent by the external context, have to be somehow universally valid. This is very difficult. Because, for example, naturally, the human language, it is based on this kind of uh, ambiguity. But then it's not probably an ambiguity. It is simply the nature of the language to be dependent by the context, dependent by the situation. For example, there is a lot of differences in between the same words for the language inside the for example, academic, and in terms of uh, common language. The same idea of architecture, for example. The name of this course, it is Artificial Intelligence and Architecture, or better, Architectural Urban Planning in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. If you search in internet with a popular uh, search engine, Architecture, Artificial Intelligence, a lot of websites, and basically most of the websites, intend architecture not like building design, not like the work of uh, architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, or Zaha Hadid, or Frank Gehry, but they intend the computational architecture, or better, the logic structures of artificial intelligence, which is still architecture, but this is a typical case of ambiguity. And nowadays, in 2020 at least, the ambiguity in terms of words, it is one of the major problems in the search engine. 
In the case of artificial intelligence, this point is extremely dangerous because a process of the machine could generate different output according with the interpretation of the words. Now, in artificial intelligence, it should not exist any form of uh, ambiguity, any form of interpretation. The knowledge should depend only on the sentence themselves and not on the external context in which the machine finds itself. For example, if the machine needed to record the temperature outside, the outdoor temperature, cannot simply say, ah, it's cold, um, yes, it's, uh, it's almost cold, but it's less cold than yesterday. I feel, uh, I feel yes, maybe. Can you imagine um, a report from a sensor based on this kind of language? It is simply a mess. It is uh, not current. It is uh, not solid. It doesn't give any valuable information. So this is what exactly this sentence means when we ask to a sensor or to a machine a output based on a sensor which acquire data from the external world there is a no possible misunderstanding or ambiguity when we ask to our telephone it is cold outside the telephone cannot simply answer well the sensor outside told me yes it is almost cold but uh, it depends of the condition and so on this is the opinion that you can ask to your uh, grandmother, the opinion that you can ask to your friend. But when you ask to a machine a specific question, we expect a specific data. So this is very scientific. From the machine, what you're going to ask is the temperature outside today is 16 degrees. And then you personally, according with your own personal feeling, body reaction, can decide if 16 degrees is cold or hot. But in terms of machine, it shouldn't exist any possible ambiguity. The context-free, it is extremely important because the machine should not have any possible relationship with, uh, we mentioned this slide, here and now, which depend on the context. Uh, there is a technical word that I mentioned in this uh, slide. Those issues are called indexicals. These are technical words. Every time that you are going to the, uh, discuss the artificial intelligence and the logic beside the artificial intelligence, remember very well that there is not possible to accept the ambiguity about here and now. Ambiguity in between uh, data, which means something in uh, one country and something different in another country. For example, the idea of uh, friendship, it means something different in between different countries. This kind of ambiguity, this kind of uh, relationship with a specific context in artificial intelligence should not exist. There is also a third thesis, and in this case, I am afraid that uh, we have to be extremely technical. And um, I just uh, want to mention some key meaning, but we cannot go inside the deep discussion simply because we become very technical and become a very abstract logic. But we have to mention. The thesis three that we need to mention is that for the most versatile machine, the language in which declarative knowledge is represented must be at least as expressive as the first order predicate calculus. And that is a very important assertion. We need to check what is the first order predicate calculus. And uh, this is uh, not uh, a sophistication. This is a very basic discussion. As the title of this slide mentioned, Logic and Artificial Intelligence, if we have to discuss the artificial intelligence and its logic, if we have to generate an artificial intelligence, then we need to discuss how this artificial intelligence is processed. What is the artificial intelligence? What is the basis of this uh, artificial intelligence? The thesis three remind us that the machine thinking, the most general, the most uh, universal machine, have to be so general, so universal, that have to be based on the first order predicate calculus, which is a very technical word in the, the world of uh, the uh, logic. I read the definition from the Encyclopedia Britannica. 
Predicate calculus, also called logic of quantifiers, is a part of modern formal or symbolic logic which systematically exhibits the logical relationship between sentences that hold purely in virtue of manner in which predicates or known expressions are distributed through ranges of subjects by means of quantifiers such as all and some without regard to the meaning of conceptual contents of any predicates in particular. Such predicates can include both quantities and relations. And in a higher order form, called the functional calculus, it is also include functions which are framework expression with one or with several variables that acquire defined truth values only when the variables are replaced by specific terms. The predicate calculus is to be distinguished from the propositional calculus, which deals with unanalyzed whole propositions related by connectivities, such as and, if, then, and or. This is quite complicated. In fact, what is the key point of the predicate calculus? The predicate calculus, it is a very abstract position in the logic, which doesn't concern, it doesn't focus his attention on the meaning of the terms inside a certain kind of context, but only concern the relationship in between the element of a certain sentence. For example, if I say I love you, you can be very happy or very sad because you extract the meaning. Because there is somebody, I, which say to you a certain kind of important meaning, love. So in this case, you are focused on the meaning of the terms inside this sentence. But the predicate calculus, it doesn't concern this. It simply reflect the relationship in between the terms. This is the logic of this paragrapher. Of course, the situation is much more complex because we have to go into a formal logic, which I'm not going to, to do in this class. But the key point is, in order to build a very solid artificial intelligence, this artificial intelligence has to be based on a very solid logic. And the predicate calculus, which belongs to the formal logic, it is one of these elements. There is another term that we need to discuss, the first order logic. The first order logic, also known as a quantification theory and a predicate calculus, this is another definition, is a term that refers to predicate logic in which quantified predicates may range over a single domain of discourse that contain distinct objects. There are several first-order logic, but the most commonly studied is a classical first-order logic, which is supposed to be an extension of propositional logic. As you can see from this sentence, we are in front of a discussion about logic. And this is not strange. Because we are going to discuss the artificial intelligence, we need to understand what is the basic rule of the logic. Those kind of logic must be very abstract. Otherwise, the artificial intelligence, it is based on ambiguous basement. And this is very dangerous. There is one problem on this stuff, that the logic, it is still a human logic. It is still based on how our brain, it is structured. I'm not very sure that this kind of fundamental logic can be universal. But according with the predicate calculus, this kind of discussion must be very, very abstract. This slide shows the fact that the first order logic, it is a sort of symbolized reasoning. And it means that each sentence each part of the discussion, each part of the statement, it is divided, the sentence say, it is broken down into subject and predicate. The predicate modify or define the properties of the subject. You see, it doesn't touch the meaning of the sentence. It touch only the structures of a sentence. And even better, it concerns the structure of a thinking. This is even more important. And you can see in this uh, slide, here we are really touching something quite complicated and something very specific on the formal logic. I give you one example. Intentionally put the example in order to give you the 
idea how abstract should be the discussion. The section three of this slide say that a sentence in a first order logic is simply written in form of Px, where the P is the predicate and X is the subject, which represent the variable. That's it. So every possible concept, every possible sentence, every possible expression, it is simply Px. Everything you can say Everything you can, can think can be formalized in this form. Complete sentences are logically combined and manipulated according with the same rules of those used in Boolean algebra. Then I please you to search the Boolean algebra, which is a very fundamental element in the contemporary thinking. In this class, we are not able to discuss deeply on this point because we are going to touch some very technical issue and it's not the intention of this course. The last part of this slide is probably the most important. What does it mean? The first order logic, it doesn't concern the meaning of uh, any specific language or any specific uh, sentence. It is something very general. If we are able to reach the most universal rule in every possible language, this is a great goal because this kind of rule, it is not related on a single language, for example, French, but it is a common logic in every possible human language, existing or non-existing. That is the point. Every form of language, human, but in theory also non-human, it is based on this first order logic. And then, and this is the point, if the first order logic is complete, if this system it is well structured, then automatically every human language it is immediately accessible by the computer because it works always the same. What the first order logic assert that it exists a sort of universal rule in every possible human language, at least human language, but probably also this discussion can be even more general than human existence. The first order logic discuss the logic of every possible language, and then the step is very clear. Every possible human language, it is immediately understandable by the computer. Yes, because if the rule is clear, it is only a problem of vocabulary. And everything of this stuff, it is already accessible over internet. I give you a very simple example. We give to the computer the rule of thinking, the first order logic, then he understand how the language it is structured, and then the step forward is to acquire dictionaries, vocabularies. Then, if the artificial intelligence is able to put together first order logic and vocabulary, then it means he can understand every possible language of human. And then every book, every paper over internet is understandable, is accessible. And then he simply learn everything that it is already published in the history, or at least everything which is published over internet. This uh, slide uh, is also quite important because uh, it asserts that the first order predicate calculus, it doesn't concern, uh, again, the uh, philosophy, or it doesn't touch uh, deeply the uh, meaning of a certain kind of sentence. We are not going to discuss if the sentence says something which makes sense or not. But the first order predicate calculus only discuss about a disjunction, negation, and universally and existentially quantified sentence. It means that those kind of uh, discussion about the first predicate calculus just reflect the most universal truth inside one sentence. Everything is under interpretation. We already uh, discussed this issue in other classes. Uh, for example, in the class of history of modern architecture, when we talk about uh, the deconstructivism and the postmodernist philosophy. Everything is interpretation. The work of the first order predicate calculus is exactly to avoid this logic. It should exist something that is universally valid, universally truth. 
and it does not suffer from those limitations and those meets our minimal representation requirements, which it means we need to have a sort of minimal requirements to declare that a certain situation is true. But again, and we come back to the first sentence in this slide, we must also understand what is true. And this is a fundamental element in every possible discussion about the logic. So we see that the discussion about artificial intelligence is something very complicated because artificial intelligence, because it's intelligent, have to be based on a certain kind of logic. But then when we touch what is the key element of the logic, what is the truth, then we have a not problem, but uh, important question concerning the nature of the reality. In this slide, we touch uh, an example, even a funny example, and it is the case of a green box. It is just a case, of course, you can um, replace with anything you want. Now, you, me, everyone, except the people who unfortunately have some illness, we all know what is a green box. <laughs> it is a box with the color green. And then it's obvious for everyone, even the child knows what is the green box. If we want to generate a sentence in the mathematical way, in logic way about the green box, we have to use this formulation. And I mention in the second sentence, the X box X, green X. This sentence, this script made in formal logic, express the meaning that a box is green. But then it is also very important to notice that the machine may believe or not believe that all the boxes are green. This mathematical expression said that the machine experience is that the box are green. But it doesn't mean that the machine understand or believe that the box is green or even that the, all the boxes are green. This is quite important to understand. What it is common for our experience, it is very different from the experience of the machine. This is, of course, just a case. The case of the green box assert that, according with that logic formulation, that uh, mathematical formulation, that the machine acquire the data that one or many or every box are green. But uh, this case uh, you must extend. For example, we can put inside the machine different sentences in uh, different forms, for example, in a logical uh, equation, and the machine could have a different form of truth. The box is green, the sky is blue, the bird fly, whenever, it doesn't matter. So the machine has a sort of database, has a sort of bank data of sentence. And those sentences are fact. Those sentences express a certain kind of truth. We remember that we still need to understand deeply what is truth. Yes, because if we put one information on the computer, the green box, for example, the machine understand that the box is green. For human beings, it's something a little bit more different because we have interpretation, but we cannot have interpretation in the formal logic for artificial intelligence. Otherwise, the system is not solid. That is one problem, one difference in between human being and machine. This kind of discussion, if it seems very abstract and very unusual, in fact, they are the basic discussion, the fundamental discussion about the intelligent agent architecture. So every form of artificial intelligence have to be based on the first order predicate calculus and the formal logic and the database with the information of truth. In this slide, we touch a very important problem that we are already illustrated in the previous moment of our class. It says the process should transform a set of sentences together with the input to the machine into another set of sentences and thus change the machine state. The function act is a function of such a set of sentences and the machine's input and produce as output a machine action. What does it mean? It means something extremely important. The first part said, we have a certain kind of uh, situation, the state of the universe. 
the weather outside the windows, the indoor humidity, certain situation. When we say the process transforms a set of sentence, sentence, it doesn't mean a human sentence. It means a certain kind of situation. For example, the state of the indoor climatization of a room. This is a sort of environmental structures. Because a sentence, I repeat once again, and I mention must be very clear in your mind, a sentence in this case, it doesn't mean a human sentence. It may be a human sentence, but it may not. I give you two examples. First example, the machine, the sensor, should record the indoor temperature indoor climatization of a certain room. This one, you can call it a state. This state generates a sort of data. Those data is a sentence together with the input of the machine, which it means this state, it is acquired by the sensor, by the machine, and then transformed into another state of sentence. At the same time, when I speak to my microphone, to my mobile phone, in this moment when I record the lesson, I produce sentence, in this case, English sentence. Then the machine, the, my telephone, transform this sound, my thinking, my verbal action into data, and then those data are transformed into something else, basically binary code. This is very clear. Environmental situation of a room, temperature, moisture, wind, lighting, and so on. Or myself, which I speak in English, and the telephone acquire data. In both of those cases, we are in front of sentences, not verbal sentence in both of the cases, but we are in front of a situation. In this case, it is called sentences. Those situation, sentences, are acquired by the telephone, or sensor or something else, and then it is transformed in something else. Here in this slide, you can say into another set of sentences. Example, my thinking, mental process, are transformed into sound by my mouth. Then this sound, it is transferred by air to the telephone, and the telephone transform this sound in binary code, and then so on. There is another situation. Imagine that you have a sensor in your room or a webcam which record the state of your room every moment, like the CCTV. In this case, the room is full, empty, cold, hot, windy, and so on. This is a certain situation. This certain situation is transformed into another form of sentences, binary code again, and then it is transferred to cloud, become big data, and so on. In this sentence, it is clearly expressed that this changed the machine state. Yes, because the machine acquiring data, it changed his situation. For example, the machine record my voice. The memory of my telephone now is full of binary code 010101, which is the transformation of my sentence. Then, at the same time, this kind of situation produce also the output of the machine action. And this is the last part of the first sentence, which it means because I am speaking or because the environment, it is too cold or too hot, then the machine can react. Ah, fine, very well. The room is too cold, then I activate the heating or the room is too uh, hot, and then I open the air condition, and so on. This sentence simply means that every initial situation produces a sentence or coding or numbers or data, which is transformed into another set of sentence, binary code, and the machine interpret this input with a certain kind of meaning. The machine change his state, for example, notice that the room is too cold, and then generate an output, open the heating or open the air condition. This is the meaning of the first sentence. Here, the second sentence, it is probably the most important, because when a programmer, in this case it is defined designer, a human, but also can be a machine, because now we have a programmer which is automatic, which is a software. 
when a designer intend to generate a sort of logic, a sort of program, a sort of software which is intelligent, then he must imagine that the world, the universe, or the simple room that it is the subject of the discussion, then in this case, that kind of environment, we call it world, it is a finite state machine. In this case, what does it mean? It means that every physical world, material, the table, the room, the universe outside, should be considered as a mathematical structure. It is not made by atom, molecular, and so on. But it is a mathematical structure. It is a mathematics, which it based on object, function, and relations. These three elements are very important. Object, function, and relations. It is uh, very controversial. The discussion is still open. There are a lot of very beautiful and very deep uh, investigation and consideration about this point. Because what is the universe? What is your room? Who are yourself? And again, why we use mathematics to describe that kind of universe? Because until now, we didn't touch architecture and urban planning. We only touch formal logic. We only touch mathematical structures. And then why? Why we must touch mathematics to describe architecture? Because there is a theory that everything is mathematics. And it is not a new theory. For example, Pythagoras considered exactly this situation. The universe for Pythagoras has a mathematical structure, has a geometrical structure. Everything is mathematics. The same question is still valid to today. Is the mathematic a good way to describe the universe? Yes, it is. It works very well. And then the second question. Is the mathematics our human way to describe the universe or the universe has a really a mathematical structure? So this is a very open question and there is no answer. Don't trust to the people who say it is a yes or it is no. There is no clear answer on that. Someone believe yes, some other believe no, but it doesn't matter for this moment. What it is important in this moment to understand is that when we are talking about artificial intelligence and formal logic, the designer human designer or machine designer, it doesn't matter, consider the universe as a mathematical structure based on object, function, and relations. There is one big issue, actually, which, by the way, it is very close to the Buddhist doctrine. This is very interesting, uh, in my point of view. Uh, the third sentence in this slide say that um, we must consider the fact that when the machine acquire data from one world, one universe, in this case, we are in front of uh, uh, what it is called a certain kind of world, a finite a state machine function effect, which it means that you can imagine your room. This room has a certain kind of situation, geometrical structures, temperature, moisture, uh, indoor co climate condition, and so on. In this case, that is a universe. This universe is described by parameters. How many parameters? A lot. It doesn't matter. Three, four, ten, ten million. This kind of situation, it is the world one, the initial world. According with this old world, the initial world, the machine generates action. For example, make it more hot, more windy, more cold, or change the geometry. This one generates a new world state. We have to remember that in terms of mathematical structures of the world, which is the deep logic of artificial intelligence and his uh, logic, then we must consider that the mathematical structures of an initial world generate a sort of input into the machine, the machine react and generate an output. This output, it is a new universe. This is very important to understand the logic of artificial intelligence and the logic of the architecture and urban planning in the age of artificial intelligence. So please remind very well, because what we are going to discuss, and we will be even more clear when we discuss about uh, IoT, it is that an initial state generates input into the machine, the machine react, generate an output. This output it is a new universe, new story.
state. And all urban planning and architecture in artificial intelligence it is based on this specific process. This slide touches something quite uh, uh, complicated. We know that uh, when we discuss about artificial intelligence, uh, there is always a mind uh, inside the artificial intelligence which uh, intend to understand the world. But there is also what it can be called the creators the one who generate this artificial intelligence. And in this slide, it is called the designer. Again, this designer can be human or non-human, it doesn't matter. The first sentence in this slide can sound ambiguous because it says the designer of a machine that is to interact with the world never know what the world object function and uh, relations actually are. He must guess. In this point, you may be a little bit um, confused because it seems that the designer knows everything and put every possible function or the way of processing situation into the machine. And that is a mistake. Artificial intelligence, it is not brute force. What is brute force? The brute force is, for example, you can imagine to design one software to have a dialogue with human beings. At the very beginning, I remember very well, there are a lot of software to dialogue with the human being. Hello, how are you? And the machine answer, uh, yes, okay, very well. Are you human? No, I'm not human. Where are you? I am inside your telephone. I am in uh, Silicon Valley and so on. The first case of software for dialogue with human are based on brute force because the designer, in this case the programmer, imagine every possible question that the human being give to the machine and give every possible logic answer which is necessary. For example, the human say, oh machine, today I am sad, and the machine could have a choice of uh, 20 possible answers, for example. Not every possible answer, because the question is one. Every question has several answers. This is brute force. The brute force, it is not very intelligent. It is simply messy. Option A, B, C, D, number 100. But it is already imagined by the programmer. There is no invention. There is no intelligence. The intelligence come out when the machine doesn't have any pre-imagined answer, but the machine generate a new answer according with his intelligence. This is the difficulty. The example is very clear. If a human asks to another human a question, the second human doesn't give the answer according with a repertoire of possible answer. That is a formal. But the intelligence of human generate answer according with some specific situation. That is intelligent. The new architecture of the artificial intelligence nowadays forget the brute force, forget the structures where many possible answers are already pre-installed in the machine. The machine is basically empty. The database is empty. What the machine does is to generate an answer according with some specific situation, which is object, function, and relation. When the sentence say the designer of the machine have to guess, guess it doesn't mean according with some capricious situation, according with some personal opinion, but he must guess invention. Invention, it is very difficult to imagine because invention can be everything. The key uh, example is of the move of AlphaGo against the super champion of the game of Go, which demonstrated the intelligence of the system. The move of the software, it is not inside the repertoire, the catalog of possible move played in the past. It is new. It is an invention of the machine based 
on a very sophisticated algorithm of the artificial intelligence. In order to generate this kind of guessing, the designer must generate a sort of concept. Here in this slide, it is called conceptualization. Object, function and relations, it is the only possible element of the designer action. And he must generate a very solid and open and very powerful concept for these three elements. The designer it doesn't input into the machine many possible answers, many possible situations, a catalog of possible output. He must conceptualize every situation possible. He doesn't put solution A, B, C, D, and so on, 10,000 possible situations. He must conceptualize the possible output, and this is radically new. Because in this case, the output could include some possible situation that it was never happened in the past, and that it is the invention. When we said in the example of the green box that the property of the box is to be green, this one, it is a typical case of brute force. The designer input in the machine that the box is green. But in the case of the conceptualization, we need to put a sort of process that let the machine understand the property of the color green or blue or red or whenever. The machine must be open to understand that the box can be green or non-green. And then the question is, what is green? What is the truth to be green? That is the point. So the designer should generate a set of conceptualization, which it means that he must generate a process to conceptualize the world because the machine must understand what is green, but not only what is green, what is blue, what is red, what is box, what is a sphere, what is anything. This is what it is really important because the machine must understand whenever the world actually is. And this is very important. The designer must conceptualize a process. The conceptualization, it's impossible to be complete, universal. So he must generate a sort of flexible conceptualization. The conceptualization can be modified by itself. The final performance, the final output, the final intelligence, the quality of the intelligence of the machine, it is decided by the conceptualization. Every mistake of the machine performance, it is based on the deficiency of the conceptualization. The task of the designer to generate artificial intelligence is very complicated because finally the architect, in this case the architect of an artificial intelligence, uh, here is the ambiguity of the human language, must generate a sort of mirror of the reality. What is the reality? For example, the reality in this moment outside my windows is it's a sunny day. How to define a sunny day? We have parameters. For example, the lighting, for example, the wind, the temperature, the cloudy, and so on. So how to generate a mirror of the reality? For the human, it's very simple. Sound, visual, taste, the senses or even some more abstract thinking. But in the case of the artificial intelligence, we have to generate a sort of a mirror of the reality. And this kind of mirror of the reality must be input inside the machine and give to the machine the rule of reasoning. We have to generate a sort of notion of interpretation. This is very important. So finally, the designer task, and here I point out four elements, it is invent word object relations and functions, a first order predicate calculus language, uh, number three, an interpretation of the expression of this language, how can the machine understand this language, it means, and uh, fourth, compose a set of sentences in the language such the interpretation of those sentences is a model for the set of sentences, which it means how to use the sentence. In this case, uh, the author, Niels Nielsen, 
touch a very important uh, element, which is the difference in between machine belief and machine knowledge. Generally talking, in artificial intelligence, it is discussed in most of the cases machine knowledge. But in fact, the most deep element in the artificial intelligence, and generally speaking in every form of intelligence, is what machine believes. And this is the reason that knowledge, it means the notion of element that you have in your brain. Believe it is a sort of critical vision. Now, the critical vision is very intelligent because according with our experience, we can distinguish if a certain kind of knowledge is correct or not. For example, the critical belief, it is something that distinguishes what it is correct and what it is incorrect, according with the human benefit. We touch a very sensitive point because machine beliefs and machine knowledge, now we understand that it's something different. Machine knowledge, somehow, it is still a brute force, the quantity of information that a machine has in his mind, in his theoretical mind, in, in his mathematical mind. Machine beliefs is what the machine believes to be true or not true. It's a sort of a deeper form of knowledge. But then another more abstract question, and this is my own opinion, is what is correct to believe and what is incorrect to believe, which is the critical assumption. The critical assumption, in my personal point of view, is the most important element in the knowledge. We know facts, we believe in fact, but our critical perspective understand if knowledge and belief are correct or incorrect. The world of object relations and function from the designer generate a sort of world of the machine. The supreme task of the designer is generate a knowledge based on those relations and believe, but I put my opinion, more than believe it is a critical knowledge. In this part we touch uh, a fundamental point, uh, without any doubt. Nielsen points out uh, this concept very clearly and we completely agree. In artificial intelligence, there are two elements which is uh, fundamental. It is a uh, two function that are commonly used in uh, programming, which is uh, mem and act. Mem, it means uh, memory. Act, it means action. This is clear. It is the English word. It is an English concept, but it is, a, generally speaking, human concept. Translate into English language. Mem, or memory, change the sentence and thereby change the machine state. Perhaps new sentences are added or existing ones are modified or deleted in response to a new sensory information. The function mem may also produce a change in the machine state in the absence of sensory information. What does it mean? For example, you have a machine, a mind, a artificial intelligence. This artificial intelligence is empty. <laughs> For example, new hard disk. The function mem add information inside the machine mind. What does it mean? It means that the situation change. Before you have nothing and after you have an information, a temperature, a form, anything that you can imagine. It means that the machine before and after this information is different. Then we imagine a second situation, a situation where the machine has a sort of information. For example, the indoor climate situation of a certain room. Then this situation change because uh, the temperature become more cold or you open the window or a person come inside. And then the situation of this universe, the room, change completely. This case, this memory, the acquisition of information inside the computer mind generate new world which it means modifying the machine state. So it is a sort of evolution, an evolutionary state. Attention, the MEM function, it doesn't concern only passive information. For example, the temperature of one room, for example, some data, but it is a state of the mind of the artificial intelligence. This is much more complicated. The computer think in a certain way, thanks of this MEM 
function, the machine modify his state and think in a different way. I give you a very simple example. When you are a child, you may think that the world is very beautiful, very nice. Uh, the parents uh, probably or your family, it is uh, all your world and you are happy. So, but then something bad happened or something good happen, it doesn't matter. For example, you go to the school and then your world start to change. So your mem, the function mem, alterate your inner state and something bad or something good could happen. And then your vision of the world, it changes completely. It is a machine state, in this case, the machine of your brain or the machine of your mind, which change. And then your conception, your process, of thinking change. So this is why MEM function is so important. ACT, it is also very important because it is the machine declarative knowledge affects its action through the function ACT. It means that ACT, it is the function that let the machine intervene on the world. For example, state one, the room is empty. State two, the room is full of three persons, for example. Then the machine acquire, thanks of the function mem, this new state, and then act opening the air condition, for example. Machine mem, machine act, it is a two very important element in every form of artificial intelligence. Finally, it is clear that the function mem can imply reasoning because it generates an alteration of a state. I want that you quietly read this sentence so you can close the video now, read very clear this sentence and then think what does it mean. It means that it is a sort of process of thinking of the designer in front of the machine. We take back the case of the box. In this case, the box is blue, not green anymore, but it doesn't matter. It can be any kind of color. If we want that the machine think that the box is blue, then we must think in this way. This form of logic sentence, logic behavior, generate the most abstract and universal idea in terms of box in relationship with blue. This phrase is a sentence, not written in English, but in a uh, formal logic, imply that any computation on a set of sentences that produce new sentences. It means that this form of description, this form of writing, imply that every possible discussion on the relationship between box and blue are perfectly crystal clear in the machine mind. You can understand that uh, how complex is the generate a universal language for the machine. So finally, what can we learn from the previous slide? First, intelligent machine designed according with the logical approach are state machine. Was state are set of sentences. It means that if we want to build an intelligent machine, then we must generate a sort of machine based on state. Those state can evolve. These states are based on set of sentences, which is not English or Italian or Chinese or whatever. It is sentences based on formal logic. Point number two, machine state transition are governed by a function of acting on the sentences set and the input of the machine. So there is a sort of set situation and input of the machine that it is called state of transition. It is a sort of evolutionary system. Point number three, an important component of MEM is sound logical inference. Machine action are governed by ACT. Do you remember that the two important functions in the machine process, MEM and ACT? Machine action are governed by ACT of the machine state and inputs. The intended interpretation of the sentence in a machine state involves object, function and relations that are the designer guess about the world. These three elements are probably the most important issues on the previous discussion. 
If we want to summarize, in short, all the previous discussion more extensively, we can say that the most important part of the artificial problem involves inventing an appropriate conceptualization, intended model. Current conceptualization involves object, function, and relations. Particularly different subjects to conceptualize are, for example, mass, substance, processes, events, action, beliefs, time, goal, intention, plan. Nielsen point out this element because all those uh, concepts, for example, events, action, beliefs, time, goal, are very clear in the mind of human being, adults, human being. For example, if I say you goal, you understand that goal, that it is a very precise topic and you use the terms goal every day in your life. But to conceptualize, because we are talking on conceptualization for the machine, if we want to conceptualize the idea of goal or intention or plan, that is a much more difficult issue in terms of artificial intelligence. Remember that how difficult it is, for example, to conceptualize the idea of green box or blue box, it doesn't matter, for the previous page. You can imagine how difficult it could be to conceptualize the idea of goals. There are some discussion about the idea of time also. There are some scholars that say that time, it is extremely important concept instead of state. For example, conceptualizing the idea, the concept of a cognitive state or in the, of the intelligent agents is a very important task in the current discussion. Yes, because the cognitive state, it is a sort of situation where a certain state of thinking have to be formalized and that is a very important and difficult element. In this picture, I summarize somehow the previous discussion. So, I please you again to stop the video and think about this scheme. It should include the relation in between the different um, part of the discussion. This is quite important logic map to understand all the discussion. If you think that the previous page are complicated, well, I, I have a different opinion because the next section of the class, it is uh, even more complicated in my personal understanding. Yes, because in the previous slide, we discuss about uh, artificial intelligence, which is based on assertion. It is based somehow on the question of truth. If you remember, one of the concepts that we discussed in the previous page concerned the idea of truth. In the previous conceptualization made by Nielsen, somehow it is implied that we have the task of the, the designer of the artificial intelligence is to give a very solid, a very certain output, a very clear discussion about what is true, what is not true, what the machine believe, what the machine doesn't believe. The world, uh, confidentially we say, the world outside the window, it means the universe, the physical description of the material world, it is fixed, it generates some input, the machine elaborate, include in his memory with the function mem, and then finally act. But what implied the previous discussion is that the world exists, it is precise, it is accurate, the sensor generates data, those data are input inside the machine. The machine elaborates the data and generates an output, which it means, finally, that it exists a reality, a mathematical reality, but it is a reality, but it's not so simple. In this case, we are in front of a certain situation, clear situation. For example, if your room is perfectly closed without any modification, this situation is basically stable. Yes, there is a sort of degradation of the matter. I agree with you. But the situation is quite clear. But it is an abstract case. It is much more close to the reality, a situation where the world change better, where the world is uncertain. And this is the point of this second section of our second class. In this case, we have to talk about a probabilistic artificial intelligence. In the past, we talked about artificial intelligence in general. In this case, we go one step forward. 
When in the past we discuss about the first order logic and the propositional logic, we say somehow that if A is true, then B is true. For example, if the weather outside is 25 degree, and if in the computer we say 25 degree is hot, then it is a sort of correspondence in between A and B. If A is true, then B is true. If 25 degree is the temperature outside, and if B is hot, then A is true, B is true. In this case, uh, my example is weak. In this case, A and B true, it is something much more abstract. Actually, this is the Aristotelian logic. But this situation is unreal. Uh, if A is true, then B is true. Uh, that is, uh, means nothing, basically. It never appear this situation in the universe. It is something very abstract. It seems, according with the contemporary speculation, that it is uh, very difficult to say that if A is true or B is true, because there are a lot of cases, and in fact most of the cases are so, where we are not sure if uh, the situation A is true or not. And we cannot express clearly the idea of truth. This is, for example, the basis of the theory of the game created by uh, John von Neumann. The theory of the game, it is a certain kind of situation where two opponents, H1, are thinking of a certain kind of action which depends by the opponents. But both of them, they are not sure what the opponents are thinking. So, in this situation, we don't have any truth or false but everything it is based on uncertain. I give you a very simple and common example. I have the intention to go to the restaurant tomorrow, but I'm not sure if the weather is raining or not. It's a classic situation. So my decision, it depends by something else. If I am in my room and I decide to, for example, to stand up, or sit, this one it simply depends about my own opinion. If I am tired, I'm sit. If I'm not tired, then I wake up and walk. This is a clear situation. But if the situation it depends of something much more ambiguous, uncertain, that is a different fact. For example, I will go to a restaurant if the weather is good because my good friend only go out if the weather is good. This is a typical case where the situation in the future is uncertain because I'm not very sure if the weather tomorrow it is uh, uh, raining or sunny. And even if it is sunny, I'm not very sure if my friend has the intention to go or maybe if he has a different plan. So this is a typical case where we are not sure about a certain situation. So the situation it is called uncertain. Then in the case of uh, uncertain situation, we need uncertain reasoning, or better, a probabilistic reasoning. What is uncertain reasoning and probabilistic reasoning? This situation happens when my consideration, my thinking, or a machine thinking, or generally speaking, a mind thinking, it depends on uncertainty, which it means that the situation is not clear. It's not clear now, but it will be clear only after the event happened. But in this moment, I cannot guess. So, the probabilistic artificial intelligence, it is very important because it is one of the basis of the real world. What we analyzed in the previous slide, it is very theoretical, it is not really concrete, it is uh, very general, it is the, the basement of every possible artificial intelligence. But then, when we have to throw our artificial intelligence in the reality, eh, then there is no certainty, there is no sure things. It simply depends on an unpredictable situation. In this slide, it is, there are some examples. Reason of uncertainty, information occurred from unreliable source, experimental errors, equipment fault, temperature variation, climate change. And this is the classic example. The first case, information occurred are unreliable sources. For example, today we are in 2020. And uh, in this year, it is something very tragic uh, concerning the COVID-19. 
there are a lot of information which are correct, reliable, and a lot of information which are fake. In internet, there are millions, and basically most of the information from internet are uncertain, unreliable. Then the question is, what is our knowledge? If our knowledge is based on internet only, well, you must be very clear that internet is the factory of fake news. Sometime, in a very small percentage, there are reliable information most of the information of the internet are fake. When the information came from unreliable sources, some strange website, conspiracy theory, and this kind of garbage, then this is a problem of uncertainty. But the issue is much more controversial because sometimes it's not really very clear if the sources is reliable or unreliable. Because some very serious website can make a mistake. Or maybe because of the lack of experience, the scholar, the readers, the people who search information over the internet, they are not very clear about which websites are correct or incorrect, or in the common word. You trust a person, but this person can be fake, can be a liar. So in this case, you trust a certain kind of information which finally are incorrect simply because you trust those person. He can be a very trustable person in the common life, but sometimes he can be, for a certain situation, not accurate in his expression. It happens also to me. I have a, a great uh, a friend who I trust, but sometimes they are not reliable with the sources. So sometimes you need to be very careful about where the sources come from. Point number two, experimental errors. Machine made mistake. Or in other situation, computer made a mistake. Sometimes those experiment has a sort of bad output. For example, the computer can be broken. Point number three. Or the tool are broken. It happened to me all the time. When I buy some machine, I trust very well, but then finally the machine is broken or the equipment is not very well set and then a disaster occur. Temperature variation. And this is a clear, and also the climate change. That is the typical cases where we are not certain. We have the weather broadcast, but mistakes are possible, especially for the biker, uh, which is my case. When I travel with my motorbike, I should trust the weather broadcast, but sometimes I made a mistake and it is a disaster. Every time we need a sort of probabilistic consideration, probabilistic thinking, because we have a certain goal, but we cannot reach this goal for uncertain situation. I would like to ride my motorbike tomorrow and start my travel, but the weather is a fundamental point. Or some strange situation could occur, and then I must change my plan. If I don't have the probabilistic thinking, then I could run into trouble. If I completely believe, or if there is no question that tomorrow it will be a sunny day, and then maybe it is not a sunny day, if I want to ride a bike, I will encounter big problem. Then there is a sixth point that we would like to add malevolent mistakes. Uh, yes, you should consider some trick by someone who intentionally won't be malevolent against you. I give you wrong information simply because I am against your goal, I am against your purpose. Or I hide some very important information because of my personal benefit or simply because I don't want to reach a certain kind of goal. In all those cases, the probabilistic artificial intelligence have to consider those problems. The probabilistic artificial intelligence is a key point nowadays in every formalization of artificial intelligence. We must be very clear that the probabilistic reasoning is a way of knowledge representation where we apply the concept of probability to indicate the uncertainty of knowledge. What does it mean? It means that the, every form of knowledge we learn from the past class, for the past slide, that it's a problem of representation. How to represent the word out 
outside the window. This is clear. But now we learn something more. We learn that there is a sort of probability. Probability doesn't mean attention. This is a key point. It doesn't mean that the situation is fake, wrong or correct. It is uncertain, which is much more tricky. I give you an example. If a certain person is a liar, he give you a wrong information and it is sure that it is wrong. There is the truth. For example, outside is a sunny day, but a malevolent agent say, ah, no, outside it is raining. So the situation is truth. Outside it is a certain situation and the malevolent agent give you a wrong information. So there are two true situation and it is a true the lie but in the case of uncertainty the situation is much more tricky because no one knows what is the truth and there is no way to know the truth even if we have all the data of the universe there are always ambiguity uncertain situation it's clear for example that the classic example that i give to my students all the time is it is very different to, to heat a ball and we can calculate the trajectory very precisely or to heat a dog the dog behavior is unpredictable and we will never know what is the behavior of the dog if we hit a dog or a human being we need probabilistic reasoning in artificial intelligence when there are unpredictable outcomes, when a specification of possibility of predicates become too large to handle, when an unknown and error occurs during the experiment, or when we have a Bayesian rule or Bayesian statistics, which is a very complicated topic and um, I have no intention to touch because it is uh, really very technical and that we have no time to uh, discuss about it. In short, we need uh, the probabilistic reason in artificial intelligence when we, the situation is not so clear like the box is green or the temperature in a certain environment is 24 degrees with a certain percentage of humidity. That is not the point. It is difficult to acquire that data. It is difficult to let the machine understand what does it means. But the probabilistic reasoning is there is no reality. There is no truth. There is no false. Everything is according of a sort of probability that a certain event I put in this slide the definition of Bayesian optimization. I please you to read this definition. It is really very complex, but very solid. I don't have the intention to describe or to comment because it's really technical and no need, but I only want you to understand what we are talking about when we discuss about the probabilistic artificial intelligence. What I want to mention is that the Bayesian optimization is the core of the software of AlphaGo, which is the software which defeat the great champion, the great Korean champion, Mr. Lee, in the game of Go. So please now close the video, read this sentence and try to understand what does it means. This slide is quite simple because it is the basic rule of the probability theory. Probability can be defined as the chance that an, a certain event will occur. It is a numerical measure of the likelihood that an event will occur. The value of probability always remains between 0 and 1. This is the sort of formalization. The probability is always in between 0 and 1. It is a number. For example, when you say 70% I will be uh, promoted, it means that you believe that a certain kind of number quite high, will appear, but there is a still a certain situation where something unpredictable could happen and you will not get the promotion. PA0 or PA1 represent certain. For example, for sure, one, in this moment you are alive, otherwise you cannot listen to the lesson. Or PA0 indicate that you are completely sure that a certain event, it doesn't appear now. For example, in this moment, the universe is destroyed. No, because you are listening to the lesson, so somehow the universe exists. And there is a sort of formalization on the bottom to describe this probabilistic situation. There are key concepts in the probability. Event. Sample space, random variables, prior probability, posterior probability. Let's define. Each possible outcome of a variable, it is called an event. 
the collection of all possible events, it is called sample space. Random variables are used to represent the events and objects in the real world. The prior probability of an event is a probability computed before observing new information. Probability that is calculated after the evidence or information has taken into account, it is a combination of prior probability and new information. All those elements I think is quite clear, we no need to comment so much. What I want to only point out, it is the sample space. The collection of possible events, it is called sample space. Now the sample space, it is in general, always limited in a certain range. For example, one room, or for example, a specific time, which is quite important because the sample space, it is a sort of limited universe where the mind artificial or natural mind usually act. This is a quite strong concept. Conditional probability, it is one case of uh, probabilistic situation which can be used in artificial intelligence. Conditional probability is a probability of occurring an event when another event has been already happened. This is some formulation and it is quite important in my personal opinion because if a certain situation happens, then we must calculate the possibility that that certain situation happen again. I give you an example. If a sensor gives you a wrong description of a certain universe, of a certain environment, it may be possible that that sensor is broken. And then we must consider the fact to change that sensor. This one is a very simple case, but there are situations where the conditional probability is very important. For example, in the human behavior. When someone analyzes mathematically your behavior, for example, the path that every day you are doing in your daily life, where you live, where you sleep, where you eat, your working place, and so on, that it is always a conditional probability. If for seven or eight days you work and live in a certain place, there are a certain probability that uh, uh, your home is in a specific place or your favorite food is uh, noodles and so on. It is quite difficult that for you, the day after you are in uh, the desert and uh, doing some sport, because your behavior in the previous week, months and so on, can't imagine, can't provide an unexpected situation. This is quite important. And in the artificial intelligence, when we have to consider machine mind, which calculate, uh, manage the climate condition of a certain environment or complex behavior of the population, this kind of conditional probability, it is extremely important. Again, we summarize in a very simple concept, in a very simple diagram, all the previous discussions. So I advise you to stop a moment the video and reflect on this scheme. We want to uh, touch a very interesting element in our personal opinion, which is the brain control machine. Why? In the past slide, in the past discussion, we always illustrate the idea of an abstract mind which live inside the memory of computer or over internet. In that case, it is a sort of abstract artificial intelligence, which is only mathematical and computational. And the sensors are the eyes and the hands of this machine, which acquire data from the external world and elaborate in his perfect mathematical intelligence. And this is only one case. There are a very interesting cases, which actually are quite real, which is a, a sort of combination in between human body and machine. This is why we call brain controlled machine. In a general point of view, the brain control machine are machine controlled by the impulse of the brain. There are some electrodes, there are some sensors, which is able to record 
get the information from our thinking and then transfer to the machine. There are many cases already existing. There are experiments on rat, but there are experiments also on human beings. Attention, we are in front of two different situations. One situation is when it exists an interface, a physical interface, for example, a keyboard or, for example, some glove or, for example, some glasses, which is able to get information from our brain and transfer into another machine. For example, the robot controlled by a glove or, for example, some machine which is controlled by my physical action, which is recorded by a machine, transfer over internet or over cable to another robot or machine. That it is a brain control machine, but it exists another form of machine which is much more sophisticated because it doesn't need my body's physical action to generate action on the machine, but the simple impulse from my brain can be transformed into electrical impulse which command the computer. So it is a brain generated action. The best example in my mind of this situation is a very old movie which is called The Forbidden Planet. The Forbidden Planet is a very old American movie made in 1956 and frankly speaking is a masterpiece because of the idea beside this movie is very solid. After a certain situation, I'm not going to describe the movie, the explorer find that uh, there is a huge machine machine which is able to use the energy from the planet to generate solid thinking. Solid thinking means everything people imagine in the brain become physical, become real. Actually, it is energy. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But then what happened? It happened that, uh, yes, this machine works very well, but the problem is that the ghost of the mind, the monster of human mind become real. And then some strange situation happen. It's a very beautiful movie, very remarkable, but it is the most precise case of brain control machine. The brain, his activity, generate solid thing. China, for the first time, created a brain control vehicle. It means a car which can be driven only with the brain control. It is not a remote control. It is not a artificial intelligence applied to the machine like the Google car, but it is a car which can move and steering and accelerate or stop only with the mind control. When the driver is tired, show fatigue, then the computer, then the software activate a system to optimize the driving. This is an excellent example of brain control machine. Also in China, there is a very interesting experiment of a rat robot. It is a, a biological rat, a mouse, a very lovely mouse, which some electrode in his brain. And then there is a wireless uh, system and a battery. And the human being can control the movement of the rat, turn left, turn right, walk, stop, and so on, only with his thinking. This is a very interesting situation because human can control animals. And this is a very useful, we can say, in case of uh, disaster relief, where it is uh, too risky to lose a human, then we can use animals, which is sometimes more effective to solve a problem. And then if they die, only an uh, animal die. Personally, I believe this is not correct because the animal life have the same dignity of human, but in a certain situation, it may be very useful. For example, the human being is too small to reach a certain position. So a rat or a monkey or lovely cats can be much more effective to solve some certain situation. So this is a very interesting project made by a Chinese scholar. It's very remarkable. There are also some other quite visionary, but also very interesting case. For example, when we redesign the DNA or the cell of an animal. 
In this case, we are in front of uh, micro manipulation of cell. We are not in front of uh, artificial intelligence, but more we are in front of bioengineering technique. But the, the point is, we can generate artificial intelligence not only by coding, by computer, but also with the manipulation of cell. In this case, the distance in between artificial robot and natural creatures is very ambiguous. But I won't make a clear one issue. If we need to discuss about artificial intelligence, then we are discussing about human, which create a different form of intelligence, artificial, non-biological. But this is not the only case. There are also cases where human can generate new form of cell, new form of organism, genetic modified, for example, which is able to become robot. So what is an artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is, for example, a computer mind, which get information thanks of sensors and thanks of robot generate action. But what if the robot is not mechanical, but it is organic, it is biological? In theory, we can generate one artificial intelligence which is not mechanical, but it is biological. Because we are able to modify the DNA of an organism, then we can insert in this biological modified organism also a sort of intelligence. And we are exactly in the same point. Don't consider the computer mechanical, but consider the computer biological. In the past, there are experiments, not successful, but it exists, of a chemical computer. So a computer which works not with electricity, but with a chemical reaction. So the point is, we can create, we are able to create artificial intelligence, which is not mechanical, but it is biological. And then here the experiment start to be switched on the cell design. And it is very successful. We are still at the beginning, but it exists. So it exists a biological robotic platform, biological development of cell manipulation, which become animal, but it is a machine. It is a biological modified animal. And then no one can stop the idea, the project, to generate an artificial intelligence which is not mechanical, but it is biological. In this diagram, I also summarize the previous discussion about brain control machine, and you can have an overlook about the system. Uh, I think it's quite interesting to understand all the complexity and the relationship between the elements. In the next slide, I want to show you one uh, experiment of a robot designed by the Boston Dynamics in US, and uh, it is quite interesting for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that the performance are really very good and we are in front of a very nice development in terms of robotics. But uh, there are some uh, elements which we, we need to comment. First at all, it is a little bit scary because we are in front of a very powerful machine which even surpass the human body. It is very effective, very strong. This is just the beginning. And we can imagine uh, what could happen in the future if this machine become even more perfect. You can see that in this moment, the machine can do everything a human being can, uh, can do and even better. But this is just the first step. In the future, this machine can become even uh, much more uh, powerful. But then there is another consideration which, uh, frankly speaking, scare me very much. And the issue is this. This body, this robot, it doesn't look like a human being. It is very different. In this case, the meaning is the robot not necessarily looks like a human body, humanoid. As well, a artificial intelligence may not appear like a human intelligence. It can be something different. And I won't remark once again that is quite dangerous. In this last section of the first part of the second class, I want to point out some possible application of artificial intelligence with some controversies and open 
question. Now, it is clear that the artificial intelligence become a reality and it is already used in the modern life. Three examples, healthcare, transportation, production chain. Healthcare, for example, it is quite obvious because all the, our health examination, health test, it is acquired by database and it is used for statistics in terms of medicine production and recording of the state of the health of a nation. Transportation, it is very clear and very common the use of artificial intelligence to analyze the traffic in the big cities. Uh, for example, I discuss with some high-ranking officials in, um, in one uh, district of uh, Jinjinji uh, in China, and they declare that the artificial intelligence will be absolutely necessary in the management of the transportation of this uh, Beijing-Hebei-Tianjin area. It is a very large cluster of big cities with a huge amount of people. We are discussing about 300 or 500 million of people and the transportation without artificial intelligence, it is simply impossible. Production chain, but also marketing. Artificial intelligence, it is always inside these uh, situations. There are some uh, problems in the artificial intelligence and application. For example, many people are scared that artificial intelligence can generate a massive uh, losses of jobs in, uh, for the human workers. And this is true. It is true also because the artificial intelligence is uh, radically cheaper than uh, human workers. Artificial intelligence doesn't have human rights and it doesn't become sick, it doesn't have family, it just works. So it is much better than human workers, it works much better. So human workers can lose the job. Other person, uh, the opinion is quite different because yes, it's true that some job, it may be lost by the artificial intelligence, but it is also true that the artificial intelligence generate more qualified work. For example, less people who work in a dangerous environment, mine, for example, and more people that may control the robot who work in the mine. So this is an open question. Even more important is what happened in 2018 with a group of society uh, like Google and SAP plus uh, other organizations, something like Association of Computing Machinery, Access Now and Amnesty International to generate the artificial intelligence guideline and principle. Yes, because problems may occur during the development of the artificial intelligence, which it means we have to generate a very precise standard rule, golden rule, we can say, in order to avoid possible problems. We all remember the three laws of robotics made by Isaac Asimov. A robot may not injure human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey orders given it by human being, except where such order would conflict with the first law. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. This is a, a very early example of the um, idea of artificial intelligence guideline, but there are also some logic problems in this uh, three law. And in fact, the human beings are still thinking about a safe universal law to avoid every possible problems generated by artificial intelligence against uh, the human being. So in this case, we touch uh, several important topics that I want to illustrate in the following pages, which is uh, rise up by international debate. The first one is transparency. Transparency is a very sensitive issue, especially in the Western country, because um, artificial intelligence and in general sensors and um, internet and so on, we all know that acquire our data, our private data, our credit card, password, health information, thinking, private conversation, and so on. So the key question that is still open is how to use data, how to record data, and who use data. Second point, human artificial intelligence interaction. Number three, 
automated decision, because some decision can be automatic. For example, if some person has a sort of disease and this disease, it is not very common, then automatic decision could say, because it is not economically convenient, study this kind of uh, disease, then it is not authorized to generate medicine. In other words, if there is a very precise disease and it can be cured, but only few people are affected by this disease, then it could appear some automatic decision that says because it is not convenient, because the investment to find a cure, it is too expensive and not profitable, then no one will study that specific uh, disease and then many people will die. This is a, an extreme case, but it is a very precise situation. So automated decisions, it is a very problematic point in artificial intelligence. Another point is the purpose of data used or applied for artificial intelligence systems. The point is there are a lot of discussion in terms of transparency and how to use data. Are the data available for everyone? If yes, where is the idea of privacy? Now, the transparency is present as a way to minimize arms or and improve artificial intelligence. Transparency means, for example, if there are some dangerous situations, the people must know the case. These dangers must become public. But if this situation, dangerous situation, become public, it may cause panic. So, sometimes privacy or to keep private some data, it is useful. But it is also true that it is the rights of the people to know the danger, if danger if dangerous situation appear. So it is a problem. Transparency and the limit of this transparency, it is always a question. In my personal research, there are a situation which is very sensitive. For example, I am involved personally in a social participation debate, or better, uh, urban planning, urban design, where there is a social participation inside. So we are going to some community and we ask interview in order to understand what is the needs of the local people. This is a typical approach for the eco-village, for example. So dialogue, participation, the principle of sharing knowledge. This is very important. Personally, I only use open source system, which is based on full transparency even of the source code. So the OS of the computer or the software are open to everyone. So transparency in this case is very important. But there is one risk. If all the data are open, available for everyone, the privacy is simply gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And someone could, with malicious intention, put some dangerous software inside my computer in order to destroy my system or stole some data from my system. Yes, because it is completely transparent, completely open. Another very important point, it is justice, fairness and equity. Justice is mainly expressed in terms of fairness and of prevention, monitoring or mitigation of unwanted bias and discrimination. Now, justice, fairness and equity, it is very important in terms of artificial intelligence. So there are a lot of discussion about the law, uh, I mean human law, uh, justice, which have to be involved into artificial intelligence. Yes, because if we are talking about the state, the human society, we have a law, we have a justice, we have a police, we have a court in order to regulate some malicious action by individuals. If I commit a crime, I can go to prison and I can be subjected by the law of the country where I commit the crime. This is very clear. But who will punish artificial intelligence? How to punish artificial intelligence? Because it has no body. Sure, we can terminate the software, but maybe this software, it is created by country which is not subject to the law of another country. 
I give you a, an example of a malicious society controlled by a malicious uh, leaders which intend to exterminate all a certain kind of population. And the uh, case of the Nazi party which intended to exterminate the Jewish population, it is a clear example and not very old, just 100 years ago happened. So in this case, the idea of an artificial intelligence which can generate a, a very critical situation is a very important element that have to be considered. Five points about justice, fairness and equity. Number one, technical solutions such as standards or explicit uh, nominative encoding. Number two, transparency, notably by providing information and reasoning public awareness of existing rights and regulation. Point number three, testing, monitoring and auditing in the preferred solution of notably data protection offices. Number four, developing the rule of law and the right to appeal, recourse, redress or remedy. And finally, number five, via systemic change and processing uh, such as governmental action and oversight. That has five fundamental points in justice, fairness and equity speculation. Non-maleficence. Artificial intelligence can be maleficent, can be evil. So we can imagine a sort of artificial intelligence which self-generate regulation to keep himself safe against everything could harm, include the human. Now, the maleficence situation, it is very common in the literature because many scholars, many philosophers and many people involved in the ethics are very scared about artificial intelligence which turn in a malevolent way. So if it is benevolent with a human being, that is very nice. We have machine, we have intelligence, artificial or natural intelligence, doesn't matter, which help people to survive in a better environment. But what happens if this entity becomes evil? That it is the main concern of several books and several discussions. And some of those books are really very good, are really very strong in their position. There are some um, vision which is very futuristic, very imaginative, which is, doesn't mean unreal, it means uh, uh, which doesn't exist right now, that it may be exist. On this point, the book of Nick Bostrom called Super Intelligence, it is a very good example. In many cases, anyway, there are a lot of uh, problems related on the non-maleficence artificial intelligence. For example, the question about the discrimination violation of privacy or bodily harm. Discrimination is clear. Uh, I give you a very simple example without much fantasies. For example, the elder people, people who are not very able to use the electronic system, computer, smartphone for their uh, age, they can be completely excluded by some fundamental rights, by some fundamental process. For example, you can imagine a very old man or old woman who for all their life buy goods in the market and then suddenly they have this kind of electronic system based on uh, virtual money, Bitcoin or or some uh, Alipay and whenever. And uh, in this case, uh, they are not able to have a very comfortable life simply because they don't understand what is going on. Violation of the privacy is quite clear. If you think that the privacy, it is uh, a problem, well, I can ensure you that privacy is not a problem because the privacy doesn't exist. That's it, without any discussion. Because it's very easy to store the information of your telephone or your computer by a person which has a minimal knowledge of uh, hacking. So uh, forget the issue of the privacy. Everyone knows all your life. That's it. It's very simple. And there are many cases of uh, uh, this situation around the world. There are discussion, which is less frequent, but still present in the literature. Loss of the trust or skill, radical individualism, the risk of technological process may uh, outpace regulatory measures, negative impact on long-term social well-being, infrastructures or psychological, emotional or economical aspect, responsibility and accountability. In the investigation in the literature dedicated to artificial intelligence and ethics, there is no a clear definition of responsible artificial intelligence or responsibility or accountability. 
the definition is still not clear in this moment. There are some discussion about integrity, there are some discussion about liability, and uh, there are some proposal to introduce the issue of ethics into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. What does it mean? We all know the words ethics. Ethics that it is something moral, something good for human being or in general to the life. Ethics include the fairness, but in mathematics or in technology it doesn't exist. In technology it exists only the performance. But what if we put the idea of ethics inside the mathematics and the technology and science? Science. So a certain kind of uh, scientific discovery, it's very good, it's very nice, some machine is very powerful, but because it harmed the human life or even the healthness of our planet, it cannot be uh, used. This is a very strong and important point. Another element we already quote, the privacy. The ethical artificial intelligence seeks privacy both as a valuable to uphold and as a right to be protected. While often undefined, privacy is frequently presented in relation to data protection and data security. A few sources link privacy to freedom or trust, suggest the mode of achievement fall into three categories. Technical solution, such as differential privacy, privacy by design, data minimization and access control. In short, all the issue of the privacy, it is a priority in the case of the technology, because the pervasivity of internet smartphone computer is so high that in fact now privacy doesn't exist at all it is a fact you like or dislike it doesn't matter your opinion count nothing the fact is the privacy nowadays doesn't exist or at least the privacy depend by others example some very popular uh, search engine knows very well where you are, what you buy, and so on. Because when you install some APP, some software, you agree if you want to use that machine, that application, you must agree of the terms of policy of that company. When you agree, then all your data can be used or hold by the company. For example, when you use the search engine, the search engine may use your preferences and your research for marketing. And then it's a problem. And then you agree, this is the trick, this is the point. If you want to use that APP, you must agree to their policy. And then they may use your data for some marketing goal. So. The privacy, it is not anymore in your hand. The privacy is in the hand of multinational corporation or by the state. And then the privacy, it is not decided by you. It is not you who can decide, I want to keep this information secret or not secret. It is the company who decide to use or don't use your information according with a certain goal, according with a certain project. That is a very sensitive issue nowadays. Beneficence. Now, beneficence is um, a term which is very similar to benevolence. So, be good to others. And this is one of the key elements in the human belief, human behavior. The human culture, it is based on benevolence. What does it mean? It means that every action of the human being and also in the speculation about artificial intelligence, how the artificial intelligence should be, it touched the element of to be good to others, to benefit everyone, humanity, society, as many people as possible, all the creators, in theory, all the planet and environment. So the point is, Every artificial intelligence should and must be formed, must be created in the direction of benevolence to others, not only to humanity, but in theory to all the environment. There are some strategies that include, that promote this idea of artificial intelligence. But the problem is, first at all, the artificial intelligence, generally speaking, it is formed on human 
intelligence or even worse to the performance which it doesn't mean that the it is always direct to benevolence because performance and benevolence are two different uh, issues now in science in artificial intelligence everything have to be modified in terms of be benevolence to others, which is not necessarily included in the idea of science. For example, if science it is direct to create a very powerful weapon, and actually a lot of science is direct in that way, then this is exactly against of the benevolence in terms to be good for other human beings. Other element is, for example, minimize the power or concentration of power in the hand of few people. Or another element is benefit the human rights. Or other element is work with affected people or minimize conflicts of interest. And in general, to be good to the human being. Now, this is uh, some value which is shared by most of the people, but unfortunately, the world is not going in that direction. Uh, nowadays, one of the biggest problems of the world is that the world is dominated by market, marketing, economy. And in general, the economy, it is not direct on the benevolence of the human being. The marketing, for example, the banking, it is a clear example where the profit is above the human being. How many families, how many individuals are destroyed by the logic of the banking or the multinational corporation? Uh, for example, there are some um, chain of uh, food uh, which basically destroy the, the healthness of many human beings. And what happens if that logic it is implemented in the uh, artificial intelligence? Actually, this already happened because the artificial intelligence is used to optimize the program of marketing of a certain kind of multinational corporation. There are some big companies, and I don't want to quote the name because it is evil, that they are using already artificial intelligence to capture more sector of market who are going to optimize their performance even against the rights of the workers or the rights of the customers. This is a quite controversial. Freedom and autonomy. This is probably one of the most controversial elements in our discussion because the freedom, it is a value which was very important in the past decades. Now the freedom become much less and, uh, for example, the control that all these uh, uh, smartphone or computer affect our life is quite clear. So the freedom now it is less and less uh, uh, present in the human being, in the human behavior. Or at least the idea of freedom uh, change a lot. Freedom, it means self-determination, for example. It means um, the idea of uh, to have a free decision for my personal benefit, for example. But it is, um, the idea of freedom is quite um, controversial. It is a very complicated issue. Uh, we have to come back to the um, discussion about the anarchism, uh, for example, by Kropotkin or uh, Bochkin. It is a very difficult element that I don't want to discuss in this class. But the point is freedom and autonomy, it become less and less with artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence can understand what is the idea of the user and use this idea, this mental process of the users in terms of marketing, for example, or control or manipulation or surveillance. So it is a quite difficult nowadays, in my personal opinion, to talk about the freedom. The freedom doesn't exist anymore, at least in the logic of the past. Another very important point, it is trust. Uh, the trust, for example, in artificial intelligence, the trust in the technology, the trust in the developers, in the organization, in the design principle of artificial intelligence, the customer trust for a company or for a system. 
Now, it's important in the discussion that appear around the world about artificial intelligence, then the trust must be very solid. And nowadays, uh, there are, in my understanding of this difficult matter, um, different position in terms of trust in, in the artificial intelligence. Somehow trust the artificial intelligence because it's very powerful and it works very well. And this is probably excessive because artificial intelligence could be extremely dangerous. And many scholars point out uh, the problem of the artificial intelligence. Other people completely distrust artificial intelligence and many people are scared about the possible consequences of artificial intelligence. My position is I don't want to give my own opinion of artificial intelligence. If you really want to know, it is a great opportunity, but it is a very dangerous weapon. There is an old sentence, we are play with the fire, we are play dangerous games. But what it is important is the idea, the common idea of trust about artificial intelligence, it is a controversial in this moment. Another very important element, and in my opinion, this is a key element in the discussion about artificial intelligence and ethics, is the sustainability. Sustainability is one of the most powerful direction that we can use artificial intelligence. We know very well that the sustainability, it is uh, uh, under discussion nowadays. It is a yes, a priority, but nowadays the environmental degradation is very bad. So the issue is, can artificial intelligence contribute to the sustainability of the world? My personal answer is yes, can but with a certain kind of condition. Actually, my consideration about sustainability and artificial intelligence is quite um, complex. In short, a machine, artificial intelligence, a computer, sensors, and so on, can help a lot the environmental protection, but really a lot. It is a really a technology which can change the world. But it is also true that every time the human being have a good technology, they misuse. I give you an example. A car. A car, it is an excellent uh, tool. It's very powerful. It can cover long distance. We can travel very comfortable and so on. There are some engine which is uh, really very nice and uh, the performance can be very high. It's a very excellent tool. But it's a pity that most of the people buy car even if they no need a car. For example, they use a car just to move themselves from few kilometers, maybe just 100 meters only because to have a car, it's very nice, cool. We love machine, we love car, we love mechanism. So we buy a car, not because we really need, but because uh, it's, uh, it's fun, it's nice, it's a culture expression. That is the situation. Every time a machine is created, the human being won that machine not because it's useful, but simply because it exists. A computer is another case. No one discussed that the computer is useful. No one discussed that powerful computers are more useful. But the question is, do we need such powerful computer? Because, for example, in most of our cases, you and me, when we work with a computer, we need a very basic computer. And uh, a computer of 10 years or even 20 years ago can perfectly fit our necessity in terms of daily work. The super sophisticated CPU and a memory and so on, it is valid only on a category of people who really did a computation, but that belongs to supercomputer. The PC, the portable computer, can be very simple. And for example, the reason why I personally use Linux is exactly this. It is very cheap. It is perfectly stable. I can find 95% of the software that I need. I can find every possible solution and I need to change my computer only when the computer is completely broken. And the computer can be very solid because I use computer for over 10 years without any problem. And the machine run very fast. The point is, the creation of a technology, of a new technology, the development of a new technology sometimes is mislead by marketing. We are convinced by marketing that, the new co that we need the new computer when actually we don't need it at all. 
the idea of the sustainability in artificial intelligence is very good, but it may misuse, and this is a very big problem. Dignity. Dignity for the human being, it is a fundamental right since the beginning of the history. It is constantly misused, it is constantly denied by different civilizations, but it is a fundamental point. Many papers discuss, and this is one of the key points in every discussion about artificial intelligence, is artificial intelligence must ensure the dignity of the human being. I personally add all living creatures and the nature of this planet. Otherwise, the idea of life becomes something else. If we concern, if we reflect, if we think about the idea of life today, what we know as life, what we consider life in terms of human culture, artificial intelligence have to be changed according with the dignity of this form of life. That is extremely important. Solidarity. Solidarity implies the mutual support in between human beings and, in general, in between living creatures. It is a fundamental element, for example, in Kropotkin, mutual aid. And in this principle, I strongly believe and I strongly emphasize mutual support, not in between human and human, but in between every living creature. The idea of solidarity is quite important and it is a very strong debate around over all the world. It is not an issue of West or Eastern countries. Solidarity, probably it is a, a deeply rooted in the idea of society. This is what at least I understood in my investigation. Now, the solidarity represents always the preservation of the vulnerability of a certain categories of people or person. There are people who are more unfortunate and the solidarities try always to support those kind of group of persons. Artificial intelligence have always to be direct in the discussion about solidarity. Solidarity probably it is one of the elements that um, the human being can't avoid now and in the future. Otherwise, we lost the idea of human society. The very last picture of this section of the class show the distribution of the papers which illustrate artificial intelligence and ethics. Uh, the papers are mostly in the Western country, which is uh, North America and Europe, uh, in India, and in Australia and Japan. But what it is very interesting in this picture is that Europe and the US are the country where the social debate, the idea of artificial intelligence and ethics are more strong. This one it is a, a data from a investigation of scientific paper concerning this topic. Uh, other countries produce paper about artificial intelligence, but they are most technical. So we believe in this class, I strongly emphasize the issue that artificial intelligence and philosophy, artificial intelligence and ethics are very important.